Well, it is indeed an honor to welcome Philip Yancey to this evening's Veritas Forum event. I first became aware of his writing through Christianity Today, where he's an editor at large, <clears throat> and through a book called What's So Amazing About Grace, which was given to me by some close friends. Since then, I've read several more of, uh, of his books and given away copies of it. His words have spoken to me, to my heart, in ways that few other authors have been capable of, of doing, especially during difficult times. He shares his pilgrimage through life transparently and compassionately with a vast audience of readers. Philip is a prolific author. Six of his books have won Golden Medallion Awards. And uh, Billy Graham has said of him that there is no other writer in the evangelical world that I admire and appreciate more. A quick search last night on Amazon.com produced 27 titles that he has authored or co-authored. And I suspect there are others in, that may be out of print that I, I missed from that list. And there are more than 13 million copies in print, some of which have been translated into other languages. I intend to read some more of his books, so it looks like I have my work cut out for me. In addition to writing essays and books, he also serves as co-chair for the editorial board for Books and Culture. We're gr very grateful that you've come to UCSB tonight to speak to us on rumors of a hidden world. Let's welcome Mr. Yancey to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. I'm impressed. You could be seeing outfoxed. <laughs> Maybe you thought this was the theater that was showing outfoxed. You could be watching Major League Baseball, and instead you came to a Veritas forum. No baseball tonight? Rained out. Rained out. Oh, that explains this crowd. <laughs> OK. All right. I heard one time from a professor who wrote a, uh, an essay question for the final exam. And the essay question, I think it was a philosophy class. The essay question was, if I had only one hour left to live, I would, in just a blank page. And so he took the papers home, and he was sitting at home grading the papers that night. And he could tell some of the students were obviously just kind of brown-nosing him. You know, if I had one hour left to live, I would uh, read Shakespeare and listen to Mozart. You know, kind of kind of answer you expect a good grade for. Uh, but he's reading, and he says, oh, listen to this, honey, talking to his wife. He said, this student really got it. This student is so insightful. They, they understood what I've been trying to communicate. Because it says, if I had one hour left to live, I would spend it in your class. She said, let me see that. And she took the paper, and her vision was a little better than his. And she noticed there was an asterisk. And it said, if I had one hour left to live, I would spend it in your class. And the asterisk said, please turn over. She turned it over. It would seem like eternity. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I don't know how you feel about coming to a group that's, that's advertised as... Uh, religious in nature. I don't know if you feel uh, nervous, defensive. I, I probably would have at your age in your place. I went to a Christian college and we had chapel every day. And you could always find me because I was sitting there reading Time Magazine. That's when I read Time Magazine. And the deans would call me in on this, and they would say, now, Philip, I noticed that you're reading Time Magazine during chapel. I said, yes, sir. Well, uh, you should be listening. I said, well, sir, I've, I've mastered multitasking. Um, I can actually read the magazine and, and listen to chapel at the same time. And they'd think about that, and they'd say, well, don't you think that's disrespectful for the people who are speaking? And I would say, well, I'd be glad to go up and introduce myself beforehand and, and explain my multitasking abilities to them. Uh, you know, the kind of student that, that deans hate. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of how I felt about any, any organized group where somebody stood up and talked about God. Nervous, defensive, maybe a little guilty, slightly curious, but it, it takes some courage. It takes some courage in, in this society especially 
to think about ultimate questions, to show up, to go see something called Veritas rather than outfoxed. So I'm, I'm glad you came. I want you to relax. Nobody's going to yell at you. Nobody's going to preach at you. This is not a debate. Uh, there's no one I'm debating with. And I'm not going to try to talk you into something. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that for much of my life, I, I hated church. I wrote a book one time with the subtitle, How My Faith Survived the Church. And I got a letter from a pastor who was not happy, and he said, uh, he said, Philip, I get so tired of you complaining about the church you grew up in. I feel like writing a book called How My Church Survived Your Faith. <laughs> I encouraged him to do that. I thought that would be a very interesting book to read. But um, most authors really have only one story, one theme that they circle around and and talk about from different perspectives. And, and if I had to summarize my theme, what it would be is this. It would be uh, to survive the, the worst church imaginable and somehow end up in the loving arms of God. Uh, because the church I grew up in was misrepresented God as, as dearly as it could. For example, my um, father, when I was just one year old, got polio. He was totally paralyzed. He was in an iron lung, could not even breathe on his own. And the people in this church decided that, that God was going to heal him. So against all the doctor's advice, they removed him from the iron lung. And about a week later, he died. So I have no memories of my father because the church made a mistake in theology. Uh, I had a mother who claimed that she had not sinned in 12 years. This is hard for a teenager. Um, <laughs> how are you going to win an argument with a perfect woman, you know? <laughs> On all of the major issues of the day, those were the, the uh, 1950s, early 1960s, our church was on the wrong side. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Its most famous citizen is a man named Martin Luther King. Our church would joke about him. In fact, they called him Martin Lucifer Kuhn. It was that kind of church, just this mean-spirited, ugly, racist, ungrace-filled place. And my own pilgrimage as a writer has been to, to go back and try to scrub off those words that were stained, that were polluted, and try to find, is there anything there? So I write books with titles like The Jesus I Never Knew because I never knew that Jesus growing up in that church. What's so amazing about grace? Because I never encountered grace growing up in church. And if you've been raised under ungrace and suddenly you get a great gulp of grace, it is amazing. It's like nothing else. And my pilgrimage as a person and as a writer has been to go back and, and reclaim territory. I keep threatening my publisher. I tell him I, I want to write a book called Lies My Church Told Me. <laughs> I saw a great movie once called Lies My Father Told Me. And I, I, my publisher says, no, no, if I, Philip, I don't think you ought to write that yet. I said, okay. But I, I get letters from many people who tell me I'm not alone. I think probably the greatest gamble that God ever took was turning his reputation over to the likes of us. Because if you read church history at all, if you go to a church at all, you realize how unskilled we are at demonstrating what God is truly like. And that's been a struggle for me as, as it's been for many other people. There was a chaplain a number of years ago, George Buttrick at Harvard University. And he had a very common experience. Students would come into his office. He had a big comfortable chair. And they would kind of throw themselves down in this chair and announce, I don't believe in God. And he was quite used to this. Happened almost daily. And he would say this. He would say, well, tell me what kind of God you don't believe in. I, do, I probably don't believe in him either. And uh, I learned a different kind of God than my church taught me. And I've been kind of in, in recovery ever since. Uh, one thing I learned is that the, is, is the best way to, to grasp what God is like is to, is to look at Jesus. God gave us Jesus, I believe, 
as an exact image of what God is like. And if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. In God, there's no un-Jesus likeness at all. Uh, God is like Jesus. One of the things I notice about Jesus is that he, he never twists arms. He never tries to get people to do things they don't want to do. In fact, he says, he says um, you will know the truth, veritas, that's what that word means, and the truth will set you free. And I've come to believe the converse of that statement. It, if it doesn't set you free, then it's not truth. And the church I grew up in did not set me free. And I concluded that was not truth. But when I look at Jesus, I'm, I'm stunned at the kind of person he is. When I wrote the book, The Jesus I Never Knew, I could go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you could draw a line. The more respectable, good citizen, obedient, responsible a person was, the more threatened they were by Jesus. And the more of a social outcast, the more ungodly, the more irresponsible a person was, the more attracted they were to Jesus. It was kind of the opposite of what we think. And even the stories that Jesus told, the stories always have the wrong person as the hero. He tells a story about the good Samaritan, not the good Jewish rabbi. He tells a story about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. We don't even know the rich man's name. Jesus doesn't bother to tell us. Lazarus is the hero. He tells a story about the prodigal son. Not the good boy who does everything his father wants, but the guy who squanders it all. And I realized that Jesus came for the losers. Jesus came for the rejects. Jesus came for the social outcasts. Jesus came for me, I, I concluded. And um, sometimes when I'm speaking to philosophy students particularly, I say, you certainly have the freedom to reject God, to disbelieve in God. But I am one who believes in God, and one of the things I respect about God is that he gives us that freedom to do that. In fact, I challenge you to find a single argument against God in any of the great agnostics or atheists, Voltaire, uh, Bertrand Russell, people, David Hume, that is not already included in the Bible. The book of Job, Psalms, Habakkuk, Lamentations, uh, Ecclesiastes. And you can reject God, surely, but I, I personally have respect for a God that not only allows us to reject him and even to say he doesn't exist, but who gives us the very words we can use in doing that in his sacred scripture. That's not a manipulative, arm-twisting, freedom-overruling kind of God. That's a freedom-enhancing, freedom-respecting uh, kind of God. Why do I believe, especially coming from a church background like that, why do I believe? Well, I'll be honest with you. One reason I believe is that I haven't found any good alternatives to faith. <laughs> There's a scene in the Gospels where uh, people are leaving Jesus because he's not an easy person to follow. Don't ever follow Jesus because you think he's going to make your life easier. Jesus makes your life more complicated. Much more complicated. You've got to care about things that it's easier not to care about. Jesus doesn't give you that option. Uh, to follow me, you have to care about the kind of people I care about, he says. I can't think of any alternatives, really, uh, to religion. Every society ever, ever studied by anthropologists, sociologists, has a defined religious belief. Now, there are some scientists today who, who have no religious belief. One of my favorite science writers is a man named Chet Ramo. Chet Ramo was involved in InterVarsity, which is one of your Christian programs here on campus in Northeastern universities, but eventually forsook his faith. And he, he writes beautiful books. He writes a column in, in Boston newspapers. And he's an astronomer. And he once calculated the odds. He's an agnostic now. He once calculated the odds. And he, he talked about the, the odds of, of this planet with, with these electromagnetic forces that, that result in the exact proportion of magnetism and, and gravitation and 
uh, the binding of molecules and carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. The, the odds of that happening by chance, which he believes, he is not a believer in God. He calculated at 1 in 10 to the 15th power, which he goes on to say is, is a larger number than all the stars in the universe or all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. Well, I, I quoted that one time. I was at a very distinguished meeting. I was speaking on a panel with, there were two, there were three Nobel pri Prize winners. You've got some Nobel Prize winners here, don't you? All right. This week even, there were three Nobel Prize winners, two in physics, one in chemistry on the panel. And um, I quoted this and I said, is, is this true? And one of the, the physicists said, well, let me see that. And I gave him the quote and he studied it and said, one to 10 in the 15, one to 10 in the 15. You could see the calculations going on in his head. And uh, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are three kinds of physicists in the, in the world, those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and this is obviously one who could count. And, it, and he said, one to 10 in the 15. Yeah, I would buy those odds. And I thought, well, you can buy those odds. You can think, you can come to the conclusion that everything around us, the, the reefs offshore, the mountains here where I live in Colorado, all of this just happened. There are, there are people who believe that. But those aren't odds that I accept. Those aren't odds that most people accept. I, I view the world rather, I, I see signs, it's not a perfect world, but I see signs of creativity and, and, and beauty and genius. When I read books of theology, they always start off with these big words like omniscience and omnipotence, and then they have to explain what these words are. It seems clear to me that if, if the most obvious thing about God, if you look at this world as one of God's creations, is that God is an artist who loves beauty. I climb mountains in Colorado. You probably don't know this, but Colorado is actually the largest state in the United States. Ironed flat. <laughs> it's got more ground area. We've got 54 mountains over 14,000 feet and 700 over 13,000 feet and uh, 700 over 12, more over 12,000 feet. And I've climbed a good number of those mountains. I, I hope to eventually climb all the 14ers. There are 54, I've, I did 44, number 44 this year. So I'm getting there. The only ones left are really hard ones though, so I don't know if I'll make them. <laughs> and my wife would say numerous times this happens. I, I'll, I'll, I'll lose the trail. And I'll be hiking along, and suddenly I realize you look for these cairns, little statues of rocks that people put to let you know when you're on the trail. And suddenly I'll realize there are no cairns. We're lost. And about half an hour later, I share that knowledge with my wife. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and by then, we're very lost. And I'll turn a corner, and we'll, we're above 13,000 feet, and the trees stop at 11,500 feet and there's nothing but kind of tundra. And I'll turn a corner and I'll have the feeling, it's probably not true, but I'll feel, I may be the only person who has ever seen this sight in the history of the world, because you know, by now I'm really lost. <laughs> and there are a lot of mountains and they're very large. And what do I see? I see a carpet of wildflowers. Just wildflowers everywhere. They get smaller the higher you get. We call it belly botany because you have to get down on your stomach to see them. And, and these, were, these are flowers that, that have existed for all of history, whether, even, even though I may be the first set of eyes, human eyes, that have ever seen them. Or I have snorkeled off the Great Barrier Reef of Australia for centuries. Nobody knew it was there. No one had really seen it close up until Jacques Cousteau invented scuba gear in 1950. And now you go down, and I guarantee you there's, there's no museum anywhere in the world, the Getty Museum, none of them, that has pieces of art more stunning, more beautiful than you see on the Great Barrier Reef, on little fishes that just go around eating each other all day. That's, <laughs> that's what they do. And I, I look at this world, I look at this universe, it's just, it's lavished with beauty. And I think, 
that tells me something about God. It tells me something about God. I sometimes tell people that I became a Christian because of three things, really. It wasn't the Bible. I was immune to the Bible. I was vaccinated against the Bible in my church. <laughs> it wasn't a gospel tract. I wouldn't give those a time of day. It wasn't a Billy Graham. I, I would never listen to him. The three reasons that, that I, back then, the three reasons <laughs> that I became a Christian, I say, are uh, the beauties of nature and classical music and romantic love. I thought I had life all figured out, and those things kind of got to me at a soul level. And I remember reading at that time a book by G.K. Chesterton, wonderful writer, wonderful book. And he, he made this comment. He said, the worst moment for an atheist is when he feels a profound sense of gratitude and has no one to thank. <laughs> and that's the condition I found myself in, a profound sense of, of, of gratitude for this earth, for what I was sensing, what I was feeling, and, and no one to thank. I gradually, and gradually is the operative word, came to believe that, that God was not my enemy, that God, that, that the person who, the being who invented this universe, created this universe, created me, was a being who was primarily motivated by love. That the heart of the universe was not a scowl, but a frown, but a smile. Not a frown, but a, but a smile. I came deeply to believe that. And I've increasingly come to believe that a lot of the things that kind of turn people off to religion they're looking at the wrong way. Part of the reason they're looking at it is because the church doesn't do a very good job of explaining it. But um, I, I truly believe, if you'd asked me about, say, 30 years ago, what is your definition of sin? I would have said, well, my definition of sin is God's way of keeping us from having fun. And if you ask me now what your definition of sin is, I would say God, sin is God's way of keeping us from hurting ourselves, destroying ourselves. I wrote three books with a surgeon, British surgeon, who is a world specialist in leprosy. And he was head of the, there was a leprosarium in Louisiana at the time. It's since been closed due to budget cuts. And every year, the top medical people in the United States government would get together for a conference. The head of the Centers for Disease Control, the Public Health Service, that was Dr. Brand, my friend, the National Institutes of Health, the Army Medical Corps, all of them would, would get together and they would try to come up with a position paper of what, what they, as the guardians of the United States Health, what they should emphasize. And Dr. Brand told me about this meeting in Scottsdale, Arizona, where all these very high-powered, important, brilliant medical people, these are not preachers, these are not moralists, they're doctors. And all weekend, they're talking about, let's try to come up with the 10 greatest health problems facing the United States. If we can agree on that, then maybe we can have a, a health policy that addresses those problems. Make sense? So they did. And at the end of the time, number one was uh, smoking and tobacco-related illnesses, a whole list of those illnesses. Number two was diet obesity-related problems. I think that's now number one, some people say diabetes, all sorts of uh, heart problems related to obesity. Then there was uh, uh, drug addiction, um, alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome, drunk driving, things like that, uh, hypertension caused by stress, sexually transmitted diseases. And, and finally, at the end of the weekend, they, they came up with 10 that they all agreed. These are the greatest health problems facing the United States. Violent crime was another one. Now, Dr. Brand had spent 25 years working in India with leprosy patients. And he said, I, I have been in meetings just like this in India. Only in India, we'd have a whole different set. Number one would be, would be uh, malaria. Uh, leprosy would be up there. There may be four million people with leprosy in India. Polio, until recently, was very high. Until Recently, there were smallpox, yellow fever, diseases like that. And he said, uh, in India, if I had gone into that group of medical experts and said, you know, I can get rid of your 10 top problems, they would say, oh, this would be so wonderful. Then we would live in paradise. <laughs> well, see, we, we've done that in the United States. There's nobody getting polio in the United States, nobody getting leprosy. 
malaria, unless you travel overseas. But do we live in paradise? No, we have substituted our own, every one of the 10 top problems that the doctors agreed were things that we do to ourselves. We eat too much, we smoke too much, we drink too much, we have sex with too many and the wrong kind of people. And so I came to see that, that if God did indeed design this planet and design the human body, he did it in, in a way for our benefit, not to keep us from having fun, but to, make, to give life to the fullest, as Jesus said. A lot of people don't look to the church for advice on how to have the best time on earth, but I'm convinced that's true. In fact, there, there are lies floating around that I've looked at very, very carefully. One of them is about sex. I heard from Billy Graham one time that uh, the average American male thinks about sex every seven minutes. So, at least you guys here have been thinking about sex while I've been talking, so I might as well talk about it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, now there's a song, some of you know, by a great group called Bloodhound Gang. And the song goes like this. You and me, baby, we ain't, we ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> do you know that song? Okay. Well, now, that, that is not a philosophy of sexuality that you would get from the Bible. It's, but it is a philosophy of sexuality that you hear all around us on culture in culture, billboards, advertising, movies, and very clearly in this movie. We're just, we're mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. And that sounds very attractive, because we, you know, we like sex and we're mammals. Um, but it breaks down. I've been studying mammals, and <laughs> in fact, in, in December, I went to South Africa and spent a lot of money going to game preserves. And I, I watched how, how they do it on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> and this is what I learned. The person running this game preserve said, now, if you want hippos, you can't have just two hippos. They will never produce any babies. You have to have three. You've got to have a big male, a slightly smaller male, and a female. Because the only way a male hippo will mate is if he beats up a smaller hippo, and then he'll get excited and mate with the female hippo. Some people would say that that is how humans do it, but I don't know. If um, well, then we looked at lions. Now, lions are very different. They, they only have sex uh, two, two times a year. Uh, every six months, they go into heat, and it lasts for 72 hours, and they have sex every 20 minutes for 72 hours. They're completely obsessed. <laughs> and then they forget all about it for the next six months. <laughs> they go around chasing gazelles and impalas and things. <laughs> now, I actually live in a part of the country, in Colorado, where I see mammals doing it, like they do it on the Discovery Channel. Uh, a few weeks ago, it's always about the third week in September, I hear this noise early in the morning. It's a great noise. It's, it's elk bugling. And I go outside, and there's this one bull elk. It's got a big rack. <clears throat> and uh, then there are other little bulls, and their racks aren't quite as big. And for a week or so there, they fight each other until the one with the biggest rack wins. Again, maybe like humans, I don't know. And, and, and then that one who wins has, in, in this case, about 30 to 40 cows. And they... They kind of hang around my backyard and eat all the flowers we've been planting all summer. <laughs> and I watch them. And this guy, like the lion, is totally obsessed with sex. He's got 40 cows to take care of. And for about two weeks, that's what he does. And I can be out on my front steps videoing him, and he doesn't care. <laughs> okay. So, Bloodhound Gang tells me, you and me, baby, we're nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. Well, I look at how they do it, and I find that it's not really how most humans I know do it. Do you, do you remember the scene when 
in A Beautiful Mind, where the Nobel Prize winning mathematician goes up to the girl in the bar, the woman in the bar, and says, um, you know, I never was good at this social stuff, so why don't we just skip the small talk and get to the place where we exchange bodily fluids? <laughs> like the mammals do it, right? Slap <laughs> right on the side of his face. Worst pickup line ever in movies. <laughs> and um, we, we don't, you know, we, most of us don't like doing it in broad daylight with people videotaping us. Now, there are a few perverts out there, but most of us don't like that. Most of us don't like doing it with 40 people at once. Most people I know. And, and, and most people think about it at other times of the year than the third week of September. <laughs> or twice a year in the case of lions. And in fact, the more you study human sexuality, the more what stands out is how different it is from mammalian sexuality. Mammalian sexuality is all about creating new hippos, new lions, new elk. Human sexuality is about creating intimacy, creating relationship. And the more you study it, the more you realize it's really not how other mammals do it. It's, it's unique. It's different. It touches not just bodies, but, but souls. And every aspect of human sexuality, some of these things I can't talk about, but you can read about them in my book. Uh, every aspect of human sexuality underscores that. So when I look at this planet, and when I look at just the evidence it's given us, I think, God may not be so dumb after all. God may understand the humans that he designed, the humans that he created. I called the, the book I wrote about this called Rumors of Another World. And to me, those are rumors. They're not proofs, but there are rumors. There are times in our lives when we pay attention and wonder, is there something else going on? For me, when I experience profound beauty, I told you about the ways I did through romantic love and classical music and the beauties of nature, I start thinking, ah, maybe there's more. Maybe there's more. At hinge moments in life, you will probably sense that. I have a friend in Chicago who is a pastor. He's ordained, and uh, he runs a web service where he will, he will marry you. And so he interviews all these people. They call him up. He always has them come over to his house, a couple. And he would, he'll say, have you ever been to church? No, I don't go to church. Ah, okay. Why, um, why did you call a pastor? Well, we just thought, you know, if there's something this important, maybe, I don't know, somehow it might be nice to have God involved. Oh, okay. And then he, he leads to discussions about that. Our, our funerals. I was at one just a week ago. A person in, in downtown Denver committed suicide. Very sad funeral. And so many people stood up one by one and told about what a wonderful person this was. And I kept thinking, if only Bruce had heard these words five days ago, he may not have killed himself because he didn't think he was a wonderful person. I've never once gone to a funeral where, where somebody stood up and talked about, oh man, George, he had the greatest 50-inch gas plasma television screen. Oh man, you should have seen George's stereo system. Oh, he, he drove an Audi A4, six speed. They don't talk about that. They, they talk about how George was generous, George was kind, George was funny. In actual fact, George was kind of a jerk, but at, at funerals, it's funny, at funerals, at this, at this moment, this hinge moment when life ends, we instinctively want to remember the good things, the lasting things. George spent his entire life trying to accumulate, and he was a jerk in doing it, and yet we, we couldn't quite come to terms with that. We wanted to believe more about George. We, we lied, even, even at his funeral. Those are the rumors that we hear, and they are just rumors. You have to pay attention to them. Our own culture is telling us a lot of other messages very loudly. If you want to know what our, what our culture values, go to any newsstand here in your town, college campus, and just, just look. I, I, I do this regularly, airport, on the way through. I just stop at the newsstand and I look. What can I learn about American 21st century culture 
from these magazine covers? Well, first thing I learned is we, we like women taking their clothes off. About half of all the magazine covers I see are, are women uh, without much on. So we, we value bodies, and we value men's bodies too. You see, you see uh, athletes, we've, we've, then you read further. I remember when Michael Jordan retired the second time, he was retired three times now, and when he retired the second time, some sports writer figured this up and calculated that Michael Jordan, the next year, for not playing basketball, okay, he's retired, he's got $100 million from Nike, he's got all these endorsements, would earn twice as much money that next year for not playing basketball as all presidents in the history of the United States put together. Now that says something about our society to me. You could probably make a good case that Michael Jordan deserves more than some particular presidents. <laughs> we won't get into that tonight. Um, but if, if our society pays Michael Jordan, I like Michael Jordan. I lived in Chicago. I watched him play. I think it's wonderful. But if we value the ability to, to put a, a round object into a larger round object, <laughs> more than all of the leaders of our democracy in history, that, that's a little crazy, I think. And, and I go and I, I stand at the checkout lines and I watch the people who buy these magazines. This is the United States. Scientists tell us that 64% of Americans are overweight. And uh, having watched the checkout stands, I, I agree. That is true. So you see all these overweight, kind of slovenly Americans buying these magazines of these skinny, beautiful people. And you think, isn't this strange that here we have this great value of, of Jessica Simpson, Jennifer Lopez, and, and people drool over them, and none of them look, where are these people? I've never met one. <laughs> isn't that strange that we, we live with this illusion and the things that are so important, we're told, in this culture, and in, in some ways don't matter. My wife used to work at a hospice. She was a chaplain at a hospice. In this hospice, you had to be very near death just to get in. In fact, the average person who went to that hospice lived only 10 days before dying. So these are people at the very end of life. And she would come home and tell me about the people she got to know. And sometimes I would go down with her. And some of these people were very famous. They were people who played for the Denver Broncos in 1957. And they would have clippings on the wall of, of their time in the sun. Or they would be socialites, and again, newspaper clippings. And uh, some of these people were rich millionaires. And some of these people had no money at all. They were scraped off the street by policemen. No hospital wants them. It would just increase their mortality rate. So they took them to this hospice. It's a charity hospice. And the interesting thing is that all the things that we spend so much of our energy doing, you know, having beautiful bodies, having large bank accounts, none of those things matter to the people in the hospice. There were no beautiful bodies in that hospice. And, and the things, you know, the size of your bank account, no, that millionaire would have given all of his bank account if he wasn't in that hospice and he had years left of life. These things that we, we spend our lives on, Jesus told stories about. They told about a farmer who built bigger and bigger barns and at the, end of the, at the end, he finally had the barn as big as he wanted and then he thought, then the next day he died. And Jesus says, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Why are we chasing this celebrity culture and this cult of beauty and, and possessions when these things are, they don't last? One reason I came back to faith was because of my profession as a journalist. I, I go around and interview people. Journalists are, we're leeches. We don't have lives of our own, so we <laughs> grab onto somebody who does have a life. And the people who impressed me most, I've interviewed, I've interviewed famous people. I could tell you some famous people. And I, I, I kind of divide them into two categories. There's stars and servants. And the stars are the ones that we put the spotlight on, we put on the covers of their magazines, the Bill Gates is people. And, and I've gotten to know these people. And I went in thinking, man, would I like to be like those guys? But the more I've gotten to know them, I really wouldn't want to be like those guys. Sneaky journalist, I've been in their medicine cabinets. I've seen how many pills it takes them to get through in a day. I know how many spouses they've been through. I know how much they pay for counseling. These, by and large, few exceptions, aren't happy people. They're not fulfilled people. 
Instead, I've spent most of my career, really, finding people that we would normally overlook. And I told you I wrote three books with Dr. Paul Brand. He's as brilliant a man as, as I've ever met. He was offered the head of orthopedics at Stanford, at UCLA, at Harvard, turned it all down. This brilliant man graduated from the best medical school in England, top of his class, who spent his entire life, working life, among the lowest people on the entire planet. I guarantee you that there is nobody lower on any social ladder than someone in the untouchable caste in India who has leprosy. That's as low as it goes. They're kicked out of their own family, they're kicked out of their own villages, their hands, their feet, their faces are falling apart. And here was this brilliant orthopedic surgeon who devoted his life to putting them back together. And uh, I'm sure he would have won a Nobel Prize if he had stayed in the nice laboratories in England, but he didn't do that. He went to this godforsaken place in the middle of a desert in India because nobody wants to live next to a leprosarium. And as a journalist, I just have to tell you, I've never met a more fulfilled and grateful and balanced person in my life than this servant in this godforsaken place giving up. You know the most, the, the, the statement that Jesus made that's repeated in the Gospels more than any other statement, six times, goes like this. He says, you don't find your life by grabbing hold and seizing and accumulating. You find your life by giving it away in service to others. And I found that to be true. Not just as I will, I guess I got to do that, but if you actually do it, you are the one who benefits. You are the one who is the better person. I remember interviewing a, a man named Millard. Millard was an entrepreneur. He was, a, he was a millionaire. Practically by the time he got out of high school, he had this scam going where he paid the secretary to the principal and she gave him uh, for a certain fee. She gave him the, the phone numbers and birthdays of everybody in the school. So he would call, he was in Alabama, he'd call Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, we got this little, little tradition here. I understand Mary's birthday's coming up next Tuesday. Well, well, yeah, that's right. Well, for $5, we'll bake her a cake and we'll have everybody in the school sing happy birthday. What do you think? Would you like to donate $5? Well, what mother's going to turn that down? And, and, and he, he got out of high school. He's already rich. He becomes a lawyer and he's driving along one day and he notices that Back in those days, the 1950s, people are on these old metal Ford tractors. They look so uncomfortable, they're bouncing up and down. So he invents a tractor cushion shaped like a tractor and, and becomes a millionaire. But his life is falling apart. And one day, he's getting a divorce, and one day somebody says to him, a, an African-American taxi driver in New York City said, Sir, I, sorry, I've been over here and what you say here, but you know what you need to do? You need to go down and see Clarence Jordan in Georgia. He'll straighten out your life. And Clarence Durden was this radical Christian, lived on a commune, was blown up by the KKK numerous times. And Millard went down there and explained his whole situation. And Clarence Durden said, well, sounds to me like you got entirely too much money. <laughs> so why don't you go give away all your money and then you come back and talk to me? He said, all of it. He said, isn't that what Jesus said to the rich man? Give it all away. Okay. So Miller did. He, went, he, he gave away $2.3 million. And he came back. Clarence said, you gave away all of it? Yes, sir. All of it? Yes, sir. Well, we need to find you a job, don't we? <laughs> he said, uh, what do you think makes God unhappy? And they, well, disease, earth, well, all these things make God unhappy. What do you think... And finally, they decided, you know what really makes God unhappy? There are a lot of people in this world who have nowhere to sleep at night. They sleep in cardboard boxes. They sleep under bridges. Ah, that's a good one. Well, I'll tell you what, Miller, why don't you go build a house for everybody who doesn't have a house? Everybody? Do you think God would be happy if anybody said, no, sir? Well, you better get started. <laughs> and Millard Fuller founded Habitat for Humanity. <laughs> And they haven't built a house yet for everybody in the world, but they've built 200,000 houses so far. I was in a radio station with Millard in Chicago, and he was on the air, call-in show, and this woman called up, Jewish woman. She was furious. She said, I gave the Habitat for Humanity, and then I started getting all these mailings with all this Jesus talk. What is all this Jesus stuff? I don't believe in Jesus. I'm a Jew. 
And Millard said, well, uh, of course, Jesus was a Jew too, ma'am. But he said, he said, ma'am, you don't have to be a Christian to live in one of our houses, and you don't have to be a Christian to help us build one of our houses. But I got to tell you, ma'am, the reason I get up every morning and most of my staff gets every morning and, and do what we do is because we're trying to be like Jesus. And we think Jesus wouldn't be happy if there's anybody who doesn't have a house. So that's one of the last reasons why I believe, simply because I've seen, I've seen the gospel work out in the people I admire most. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if you read history, you will find out that the Christians who did the most for the present world, like a Millard Fuller, Paul Brand, were precisely those who thought the most of the next. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you get neither. Well, I've talked a long time, and I did agree that we would have a question and answer period. So, uh, you want to explain the rules here? Thank you very much for coming and for listening, and uh, we're going to go into that scary period where you can ask me, well, let's see, you can ask me almost any question. I was going to say, not about the Iraq War, but I'll be glad to talk about the Iraq War. And probably not the ordination of gay bishops. I really don't want to talk about that tonight. <laughs> but most any other question, I'll be glad to answer. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Philip, so much for sharing your heart and your life and even making us laugh a little bit. I appreciate that. Um, for the Q&A session, if you could keep your question, just one question per person, and I wasn't going to say keep it related to the topic, but he just said that you can pretty much talk on any topic you want. So That's right. um, just come up here and make sure you speak into the mic so he can hear you, and then just one question per person. Hello. Well, great, great job. Thank you. Um, I wrote a lot of notes. Are you okay. truly from Canada? Or are you just no, I'm not, but I'm representing. You should okay. go. It's a very nice place. Yeah. Well, um, and, and not only that, for those of you who travel overseas, it wouldn't be a bad thing to put a Canadian flag on your backpack. <laughs> it's, that is the truth. That is the truth. Okay, well, I have just one quick statement and then one question. Uh, my statement was just about animals, and obviously there's no... Uh, we shouldn't, well, here's my statement. I wrote it down so I wouldn't uh, ramble, so I'm reading now. God did let us learn from the animals a little bit, I believe, is because no animal or cat or dog you've ever seen commit suicide. They don't self-inflict pain. I think that's something that, you know, they don't hold their breath forever. They, they don't even know how. Animals just be, and I think that's something that uh, God taught us that we can learn from. Um, okay, my question. I'm a Christian, and I'm really confused, and this has to do a little bit with the election, but I don't want to get into you know, specifics or anything, but the fact is, the more I think about becoming more like Jesus, I think about uh, giving all your money away, uh, like St. Francis, taking off all your clothes, you know, get, giving everything away, and going and following Jesus. Um, and the more I think about that, I think about, what would Jesus do? The WWJD bracelets. I think about... Forgiving your enemies, loving your enemies, like you said, becoming Jesus is very complicated because you don't really want to love these people or forgive these people. I think about turning the other cheek. No revenge there. I think about don't throw the first stone. We don't, we're not supposed to judge anybody. Um, but, and the more, more I think about it, the more I see as, I don't want to put categorize labels on it, but I think of like a liberal perspective in the sense of forgiving and second chances and all that stuff, as opposed to the term that we know we hear, Christian conservative. Um, I think of myself as a Christian liberal, um, and I think, uh, and, and I'm confused, because when I look at the news, I, they don't exist. I think maybe Martin Luther King, maybe Jimmy Carter, I, I, I don't know, but Christian conservative is what I see everywhere, and I don't really identify with that. Um, so my question is, one is, I think it has to do with a little bit where you talk about the church, your own personal experience with the church, 
and sometimes that seems like a little bit more conservative, and now I'm rambling, I understand. So my question is, why is that, why, when I think of Jesus, is it not really what a Christian conservative is? It seems like to be a pretty big gap there, from my point of view. And then also the question is, who would Jesus bomb? Who would Jesus what? Bomb. Bomb. So, that's kind of the, anyway, I'm going to go sit down now. Yeah, I wrote in one of my books, sometimes I ask myself, what would I rather be, the most liberal person in a conservative room or the most conservative person in a liberal room? And more and more I feel like that's my only option, <laughs> two options. Uh, a number of comments. I, first I would say that the wedding of the religious right wing the, the wedding of conservative politics and conservative theology is, is fairly unique to America. If you go to the United Kingdom, if you go to Australia, and you go to New Zealand, the more conservative a person is theologically, wanting to follow the Bible, wanting to follow Jesus, the more likely they're going to be liberal politically. So the United States is kind of unique there. Uh, and that's true of most of Europe that I know of as well. Well, how did that happen? Well. There are certain social issues that are very important to uh, Christians who try to be faithful to the Bible. Certainly abortion is one, homosexuality is another. And uh, 30 years, when I was a child, or when I was a child, uh, even 30 years ago, like when McGovern, when George McGovern ran for president, his, his vice presidential candidate for a time was a man, senator named Thomas Eagleton, Democrat, liberal, but very strong pro-life. And that was fairly common. There were Democrats who were strongly pro-life, who were social conservatives. Democrats who were politically liberal, social conservatives. And in addition, there were Republicans who were, who were anti-war, like Wayne Morse, like Mark Cadfield, uh, who, were cons who were liberal on, on certain <coughs> issues. In, in the United States, I, you know, I don't know how it happened. You'll have to ask Karl Rove, I suppose. But in the United States, we've, we've really split. And the right wing has become totally allied with the, the conservative right, religious right, has become allied with the Republican Party. And there's not a lot of room for them. As you probably know, in the Democratic conventions, they will not allow a pro-life speaker to speak. And some of the issues that the religious right uh, things are important. I just shake my head at you know abolishing the Department of Education. What does does Jesus want us to abolish the Department of Education? But that's important to the religious right. Uh, I'm not a politician. Some of you guys are political science majors. I would just say, well, we we were talking at dinner, and I said, isn't it interesting that the two issues that that define a lot of evangelicals' interest in politics are abortion and gay rights. Both of those existed in a far more egregious form in Jesus' day. People in the Roman Empire didn't generally abort babies. They let them be born full term, and then they left them by the side of the road. It's called the abandonment of, inf of infants. And between a quarter and a third, historians estimate, of all babies born in the Roman Empire were just abandoned. And when the Christian church came along, they started taking some of those babies in. There was a whole platoon of wet nurses who, who nursed these babies, and, and they adopted them and kept them going. But, okay, abandonment of infants, far worse than abortion, because there's no question about, is this a human being? Of course it's a human being. It's born, it's been carried to term nine months, it's outside of the woman, it's a viable human being, and yet they let it die. And gay rights, uh, there, there weren't the kind of lifelong partnerships that, were being, that are being talked about today. It was usually older men having sexual relations with young boys, pederasty. That was pretty common in Greek culture and in Roman culture. Illegal in every state in the United States, I think every country in the world. So here are two forms of what is important to the religious right today. Abortion, but far worse, and uh, intergender relationships, but far worse, illegal today. And yet Jesus didn't say a word, not one word about either one of those. Isn't that interesting? That the two issues that, that evangelicals get most exercised about existed in Jesus' day in a far worse form, and he never even mentioned them. 
This seems a little strange to me. Now, he talked a lot about wealth, as you say. He talked a lot about enemies. He talked a lot about a lot of things. But he didn't talk about those things. So when I look at that, I think, huh, am I following Jesus or am I following some kind of 21st century American little thing going on here? Now, I think both of those are important moral issues that I have to deal with, but they're not as important as some other issues that I have to deal with that were important to Jesus, evidently. So you rambled in your question. I rambled in my answer. We didn't solve anything. But next question. <laughs> You mentioned that you had experiences in your early church life that vaccinated you from the, the Bible. What advice would you give to people who have been through a similar situation or who have a loved one who have been through a similar situation? Hmm. Well, there are some people who probably should take a vacation from church. <laughs> um, and I think that's okay. Um, However, I think it's, it's, it's not a good long-term solution because it's very difficult for a person to maintain a spiritual warmth alone. The Christian life should, should come with one of these warnings. You know, do not practice alone <laughs> in your home. Um, I, I guess my, my advice would be to find a, a, a grace-filled place, could be just a small group, could be a group of friends, where you're rewarded for honesty, not punished for honesty. Uh, Jesus was that kind of person, and I think the church should be that kind of institution. It, it often is not. A lot of people, the last place they would think of being honest is in a church. But I, I have been fortunate enough, graced enough, to find churches where, where I could just say, even as a teacher, man, I read this passage and I I'm really struggling here. I have a hard time even believing this. And I know I'm not really living up to it. And I wouldn't be kicked out of the church for saying that. And, and um, increasingly, you know, certainly compared to the childhood church I grew up in, and there, there are options. There are grace-filled places around. When I look for a church, I look for a place of, of diversity. You look at the Pharisees. What was wrong with the Pharisees? Pharisees were very upright, outstanding citizens. The basic problem with the Pharisees, as I study them, is that they hung around other Pharisees all day. <laughs> if, if, instead of just being around Pharisees, if they'd been with some of those tax collectors and prostitutes and di different people, they wouldn't have such a neat little view of the world. <laughs> and so I look for a church that has that kind of diversity. And um, I look for a church that, that does it. One of the most moving scenes of the Gospels to me is after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Jesus only appeared to groups of people, groups of people who already believed in him. Isn't that interesting? That, that proves that Jesus was not an American. Uh, you know, if I, if I were Jesus, if I were Jesus, and I was raised from the dead, you know where I'd be Monday morning? Pilate's porch. I'm back! <laughs>